Hello folks and welcome to the channel or welcome back and what I have next to me here is a Formula Ford from 1978. It is called the Hauke DL19 and this used to be a very popular racing class and in fact it still is today. And for some of us Formula Ford racing was a sport that we did many many moons ago. It's something to look back to and for the younger people today this is something new racing with old sports cars or race cars and that is why it's so much fun to start racing again with a Formula Ford. But it is not without any danger because these cars let's face it are 45 years old and 45 years is a long time in racing and these cars may have had several crashes they may have been modified so a lot of things can be wrong with these cars and the worst thing that you can have is getting back on the track uh, with a car that you don't trust. If you get on the track you want to have all your attention to the track itself, to the driving. You don't want to worry about the car, you have to have trust in the car. So before you start racing with a Formula Ford car that you just picked up that looked quite alright, I think it's so important that you do a full inspection on that car and if not even rebuild the entire car and what we're going to do on this car is actually going through a full inspection I'm going to show you all the weak spots on this car although it looked pretty good when I bought it but it has several areas that are not all that good at all and I'm not blaming the previous owner because I know this is an old car so I am not surprised that it has those issues so with any further ado let's start looking at some of those uh, elements on this car the first thing that I always do is actually taking off the polyester body shell so I, the complete car is then exposed. I can see the frame, you can see the engine, you can see all the components and you have full and easy access. Now removing that polyester shell is easy. Typically that's connected with some fast connectors or relief connectors. Just take it off and then have a closer look. Now the body shell itself is typically made out of polyester and you really don't worry too much about it because that is so easy to repair. The seat belts are the other thing that you really shouldn't worry about and on this car here they are in a pretty thorough state I would say. Um, but it doesn't really matter because you should replace those and this one is from 2009 that's when it expired so really uh, the seat belts should be replaced because they have a bit of uh, wear and tear on them so you might as well just replace them and this is what you should do anyhow uh, if you get a Formula Ford racing car get the proper seat belts but also get a proper seat installed and have the seat fitting to your body because the seat that was in here didn't fit me at all so I already took it out so these are things you really need to take care of and here we have all the different parts that came off the car so that's the top shell we got the nose cone and then we got the cover for the engine in the back uh, and there's some side channels here on the table on my left which I show you in a second and they all need a little bit of work and as expected these panels have cracks in them they are damaged repaired with some metal or aluminum panels here and there riveted on you can even see the fiber hanging loose here from the back so these things need to be fixed and here you have one of those quick release screws so those all need to be replaced as you can see and even the polyester underneath is a bit damaged so that's going to take a little bit of work what we've seen so far is something that really does not endanger you driving the car except of course the seat belts that have to be okay in the seat but the shell by itself can be easily be repaired and is not as much as a problem but now let's look at the more vital parts. So we're going to look at the electrical system, we're going to look on the frame, we're going to look on the suspension, we're going to look on the brakes, we're going to look actually on the engine, on the cooling, on how it's been uh, oiled. All these different areas are important to look at. We also need to look at the steering system and making sure we don't have too much play on that. So all of that is so critical. So let's start with the frame. So you need to check for corrosion and this frame is pretty much corrosion free. So I suspect either somebody took very good care of it or it was always stored inside. But you need to check specifically on the welding areas. 
And there are several high stress points on the chassis, and that is, for instance, where the whiz bones are connecting to the frame, and this is where we're looking at right now. And look for these welds. They should be clean, they should not be cracked, there should be no corrosion. And then look along the length of the frame. Now, typically, you will find a tubular chassis, and the frames are quite often running parallel to each other on both sides. But look how straight that is. It may be bent, and if it's bent, then you will have to fix it. That means it has been in an accident. But this side looks not too bad on this side. So let's have a look on the other side. Now, this side here, which is the right-hand side, seems to have like a little dent here. And I think this member goes out a bit. So let's see. And you can actually see it. It's actually um, going outwards a bit. So it has had a bump here. That impact seemed to have been here somewhere, and it's kind of slightly bent, but it did not take anything else with it, or not at least as I can see it. So overall, uh, this is not too bad. I don't think it will have changed too much on the geometry on the car, and it's going to be very tough to straighten that up anyway. So I might as well leave that because it's not really serious. And do this inspection throughout the complete frame of the car and if you see some bad spots or bad welds, then mark it because it has to be repaired. And on this chassis I've seen several of these attachments, that's where the polyester shell locks into, uh, which is pretty poorly welded. So if I see this kind of welding, I get worried. So this is not good. This, this, this is really not good. Now locally, the rest of the car is not welded anywhere like this. This seems to be something that people have put up afterwards. This I will not tolerate on my car, so I'm going to install new pieces. And here you have one. So that's going to be welded on there in a proper way. I also need to check the bottom side of this car because if you're on a racetrack, very often people lower the car so much down that it starts to scrape on the tarmac and you could have some serious damage underneath the car on the tubing. So let's have a look. This is the front side of the car and we have a protective aluminum panel underneath with a lot of rivets all around it. And what you can see here is that the front has been scraped quite a bit. Most of the rivets are kind of gone. So we'll have to take this panel off and then put a new panel up. And towards the back, it looks a little bit better, but still some of the rivets have been scraped pretty badly and some have lost their head. So uh, this whole panel will have to come off and we'll put a new one up. So we looked around on the frame and we didn't see any cracks on welding, especially on the stress points. The frame is fairly straight. There's no heavy corrosion on it. There is a little bit of corrosion in the back, but almost nothing. So I think this frame overall is in a pretty good condition. So now it's time to have a quick look on the suspension, on how much work we'll have to do there. And when I talk about the suspension, I'm referring to the wrist bones uh, or the A-frames. And we have a wrist bone on the bottom here. We have a wrist bone here on the top and then the linkage for that. I'm not talking about the uprights, the black part here, that's something we'll look at in a few minutes. But you want to make sure that this whole suspension mechanism is still in a good condition. Uh, so we have the um, ball joints that should still be good and there should be no play on it. You've got to make sure that the thread is sufficient deep into the rod because otherwise that's a weak spot. See, this one is actually loose here. Uh, this nut, which is not good. And these are the kind of things you really need to check. And of course, this is an adjustment you can do. Um, so you need to check all these ball joints, check all these rods, what uh, state they are in, especially on the whiz bones. Um, I think these are looking not too bad, although the chrome is off a little bit here. But um, for the rest, that looks good. Let's look on the other side. On the left-hand side in the back, you can see they have a new ball joint here, which is good. And then the rod is something they cleaned up, but look on this weld. Um, this is pretty poor welding, if you ask me, and it's error prone, so this is a stress point. I don't like it this way. Uh, this will have to be reworked. This is on the same side, and you can actually see that the insert that they put into the tube is not fully welded. There's a crack there, or, or an area which is not welded. Again, um, this rod here is only for uh, the torsion bar or the anti-roll bar 
But still, if you see that kind of stuff, you better get this corrected. Uh, this bar that you see right here is the tow bar and as you can see it is slightly bent. Let me take that wheel off so you have a better view on that uh, tow bar and um, that looks pretty bad. Not that I'm surprised to be honest. This guy is pretty badly bent. Uh, this is not normal and that is just because people have lifted up the car in the back and they forgot that the suspension will droop down when they lift up the car and then of course you bend these bars and it's an old damage on it but these bars well have to be tossed away and I will have to make new ones. You can't really um, straighten these out because this is always going to stay a weak spot. The other thing is of course the tires and you should never keep these old tires unless they were renewed recently but most of the time these tires will be old and maybe starved so you might as well get some new tires to be safe on the track. These are what we call the uprights and they're welded out of sheet metal and the reason for that is they are much stronger than cast based uprights. That's why you find those. And it looks like somebody has been doing some work on this and they cleaned it all up. It's properly welded up and painted. So I think these uprights are in a very good condition. If they were not, then you would have to repair it. But on this car, I don't think I need to do anything on the uprights. They are looking quite all right. In the front, the whisk bones that you see here, and this is your lower A-frame, and there's one on the top, uh, the lower one, is been rebuilt from scratch and I can tell because the previous owner told me that he has done that job. So he re-welded uh, out of steel bars uh, these A-frames and then he, let, he had it chromed. He also changed the ball joints so all that is um, quite all right and this is looking good. Although the welding isn't what I would say great welding but it's probably solid enough as far as I can tell. So that's good. We don't need to do anything on these uh, front A-frames or whisk bones. And when I said the welding wasn't all that great, and have a look here, you know, it doesn't look like a really nice weld. It's probably solid enough, but it doesn't look good. And then you have the gap there in the back right there. This is my top whisk bone. It seems to have new ball joints in the uprights. And the shocks seem to be in a good situation, but let's have a closer look on the shocks and then I'll show you something where the previous builder of this car or the guy that repaired it made a major mistake. Look at this. How loose the springs are. This can get undone while you race. This is no good. And this is an adjustment problem. This is the adjustable shock and you can see that when the suspension is in full droop, so all the way down, that this spring is loose. This should never be adjusted like this. So this is just a matter of adjusting it. And I've seen this on this car, both in the back and the front. So the preload on these springs was not properly done on this car, or either the riding height. I think what they've tried is to adjust the riding height of the car to lower it down by actually relaxing this spring and this is something that you should normally not do. There's different ways of adjusting riding height and I have a video for that. So we will need to correct the springs that when the suspension is in full droop I don't have that issue. So if I lift this up you'll see that the play on the spring will be gone. Right? See now that play is gone because I'm compressing the spring. So you need to measure the total travel distance of your shock absorbers, what they can do, and then you calculate one third for the droop and two thirds for the bump and I have a special video on that one. You might have seen that one. So this is something we need to adjust. But the good thing is these are adjustable shock absorbers and they don't leak. So I'm happy with that. In the back of the car, we don't have that issue. The springs are still under tension, even though the suspension is hanging down but we got some pretty weird stuff going on here. We have a closer look in a second. Let's see the other side. 
And here I think it's exactly the same situation. Yeah, no problem. Springs are nicely locked in place. So it was only the front part that was having that issue. So here we've got the shock absorber and the adjustment ring. Now typically you have two rings. There's one ring to adjust and one ring to lock. For some awkward reason this one has only one ring. So this will have to be modified. Either I get a new ring or I get a complete new assembly. I don't know yet but this is not right. And the right hand side, well that is certainly not right. I don't know what they've done here. Um, still one locking ring then is a piece of nylon or whatever it is. Uh, maybe these are different spring rates that they have in there. I have no idea. So I will have to take the shocks out for sure. We'll measure the springs out in terms of spring rate and see if they are the same. But I might as well just change out the complete shock absorbers in the back with new ones. So let's check out the steering and how that feels on this car. I'm just turning the steering wheel. I noticed that there is a little bit of play, but that's actually at the steering wheel itself. And I'll show you that in a second. And um, overall, that looks not too bad. So here we have the steering rod connected to the upright. And you can see that the bolt has been fitted from the bottom up. Why do people do that? Because if this nut gets loose, for whatever reason, the bolt is going to fall out. So you might as well put the bolt from the top in and then the nut on the bottom. This is what you normally should do. So here we have the steering and that is one of the most vital parts on your race car. And let's see what play we have. See, so we can move that. But also the steering wheel is movable and the shaft is movable. So let's disconnect the steering wheel. And this of course is a very old system. So we might cut all this off and weld up a new fast lock system which is a bit more safe than the old one. And this is the play on the shaft. So here we'll put an nylon bush in and make sure we have no more play. This is the paddle box uh, accelerator that looks like in a good condition. The brakes they feel very sturdy. There's even a brake balance on it. Pedals are good and this is the clutch pedal. That worked just fine when I test drove the car into the barn. Uh, brakes were working properly, but still we will um, rinse the complete brake system uh, before we uh, finally put it back on the track. It rains like hell outside, so I apologize for the noise. Uh, but here we have the two master brake cylinders, one from the front, one for the back. So let's see what state they are in. Both are girling and I think they have been renewed. In the front we got the clutch. I think this is one that I would probably renew because this is very old. So let's see what state the brake fluid is in. I'm just going to see if I can get some out. Yeah, that looks still a bit brownish, but it should be okay. Nevertheless, um, we're going to change all the brake fluid anyway completely. We'll flush the complete system and we'll check that all the brake hoses and the flexes are still in a good condition. I think on this car they have been renewed and these are the stainless steel hoses and they still look like fairly new so I, I, I don't have an issue with these. Uh, I might actually rerun those because I don't like that it's sitting like this because it tends to bend the top part. Let's see. Look carefully you can actually see that this is a bit bent here and that's just because of that rot that's in the way. So uh, it's better to reroute those. Now I noticed that some of those flex hoses are damaged. So in my case, I'm going to replace them all because that's the safest way uh, to repair this car. You could replace the brake calibers if you wanted to, but what I typically do, I make sure where I check that they don't leak and these are not leaking at all because I just inspected them throughout and then I'll just take out the brake pads and we put new brake pads in. If they do leak, then I recondition those typically. I'm still going to take them off the car and I'm going to shot blast them with uh, glass beads so they look like new again and then all cleaned up and then we rinse the whole system and we should be good. Since we are talking about the brakes, we also need to look at the discs and the disc that we have here uh, feels quite alright actually. 
It has no real grooves on it, a little bit of it. But you know what? These discs are very cheap to get, so you might as well get new ones. And then you might want to check the thickness of the discs and then see how thick they should be. And this one is about 6.45. I think these are a bit on the thin side, but maybe that's what they are. And also you might want to check if they are still straight, if they have a run out. And I put a micrometer up here and then let's rotate it and I already set it to zero. So if I rotate the disc, we'll see what happens, how much deflection we have from zero to, oops, and I'm just going to need to reset this a bit, I think. So this seems to be the max. All right. Ah, okay, so how much deflection do we have maximum? Yeah, I think it's around 10, wasn't it? So, this is like 10, which is um, uh, 10 hundredths of a millimeter uh, of runout, and this could be because of the grooves, so I might probably change those discs. Uh, I'm not sure yet. I, I probably will. I was having some doubts about these discs, about the thickness, but if I then see how they go through the brake caliber, there is not a lot of space there, uh, so I think these discs are all right. So maybe you guys know this on these type of discs, what they should look like. Uh, but just let me know in the comments, okay? So far, we looked on the frame, the suspension, and the brakes, and the steering. And that all looked to be reasonable, okay? We found a few areas where we need to make some improvements, some changes, especially on the suspension, on the tow rods, uh, the, those are bent. Uh, on the steering, we have to put some bushes in. But all small stuff, the chassis or the frame is in a good condition. There's not much to be worried about, except getting a new plate underneath in aluminum. So this is all small work. I also have to move the pedals more forward because I'm too short to reach the pedals. I tried that before, but there is provisioning for that. There are holes in the chassis to allow you to do that exactly. So now let's have a look on the actual engine itself. And then we'll have a closer look on the gearbox and the electricity. And maybe we just start with the electrical system on this car. Most Formula Ford race cars have no alternator on the engine. So in other words, they cannot charge the battery. But you still need some power because you have to maintain the vital elements on your car. For instance, your electronic ignition. So you need to have a battery on the car. And these batteries are typically very small. This one is sitting in the front of the nose. And it's probably always a good thing to change those out with a new one. I'm just going to check on this one to see what, what it tells me. Um, it is still having 12.7 volts, so it's still charged. So maybe this is still good. I'll, I'll put it on the tester later on and see if we have to change it or not. Uh, there is typically an 8 for this. And now let me show you where the 8 connector is. And on this car, the 8 connector is all the way in the back. And then you just plug in. The 8, which is actually going to an external battery with these two cables here, of course, plus and minus. And that will help you to start up the car. Sure. If you don't have the external battery connector, then I would really recommend that you put that up because it's going to save you a lot of hassle. So now let's have a look on the instrumentation and the electrical installation because that on most of these cars is pretty shitty. Uh, people mess around a lot with electrical uh, installations on cars and often it's really a lousy job. But on this car, I don't think it's going to be any different. So let's have a look. So the car should have what we call an emergency shutoff for the power and that's what this key is all about. Uh, so if you turn the key now, I have contact, now I have power through the car. If I turn it like this, the battery is totally disconnected. And this is uh, something very important to have. We've got a couple of switches and we got a couple of dials. We got an RPM meter, which is a digital meter, and you'll see it in the back in a minute. We've got an oil pressure meter, which is an analog one. And then we've got the water temperature meter. We've got some switches here on the side, some warning lights, and um, 
This switch is actually for the electrical fuel pump uh, and once the engine is running you switch back to the mechanical fuel pump. Uh, it has two fuel pumps, a starter button and uh, some uh, rain light switches and some warning lights together with a pull handle for the fire extinguisher which is going to the back of the engine. And this is really all there is to it in terms of the dashboard and electricity but let me give you a back view on how that cabling is all done. And you can immediately see that this is a really a tacky job. Um, this is actually the uh, oil pressure coming into the oil pressure gauge. And uh, I might replace this with an uh, electrical one because if this hose jumps off, then you get lots of oil on you. Um, and hot oil as well. Uh, look at the state of the switches here. This is really not good. The warning lights are not good. Um, so all by all, the cabling will have to be redone on this car shape so some of that stuff is actually loose it came off so um, this is stuff we need to fix and most likely if you buy in a race car you're going to find your electrical cabling in exactly the same condition we talked before about safety on race cars and without any doubt a fire extinguisher system is one of those now this car already has one fitted which is still up to date and it is one actually with a tube going back all the way to the engine where you find some nozzles to spray on the engine in case there is a fire. There's a pull lever on the dashboard and you've seen that red one which is connected to the handle here. So this is good. If you don't have that mechanism in your race car where it doesn't have any fire extinguisher at all, just get one and I really recommend to go for a tube based with nozzles a fire extinguisher system because the last thing you want to do is to catch fire on your car and let me show you why I think that is so important now I'm going to change this because I don't like all the nozzles to be in the back of the engine I also like to have some in the cockpit so that's going to be a small change we'll do now since we're talking about the fuel uh, here is the fuel tank and that's where the seat normally is. So you're actually sitting against the fuel tank. This is a polyester fuel tank. And I don't think that's that good resistant to the modern fuels we have. So this might have to be replaced with an aluminum fuel tank. But nevertheless, um, I'll have to make some adjustments because I need to take the seat out to fuel it up. Here is the cap for it. So I'm going to extend this with a hose all the way to the top so we can fill it up from the top. So that's one thing. You also notice that this is having like a little overflow here. I mean, this is kind of weird because this is just sitting on the side, actually dripping inside the polyester ducting for the cooling. Uh, that is something I don't want to have either. So this is something else we're going to change. The engine is a Kent 1.6 liter engine and you certainly want to check the compression on that one once you buy a car, making sure that it has no leaks, make sure that it runs. I did all this on this car before. I'm not going to do the compression test now, but you want to check all this. You want to make sure that you have a good oil pressure, that you have a good compression. You want to do a blow-by test, making sure that you don't have any leaks through the segments. Now, this engine is smoking a little bit uh, because it has some blow-by because you need to let it warm up to be very fair on this. But overall, that engine looks pretty good. It's even a dry sump engine, so we need to look a little bit closer onto that on how that all looks like. And it has a Howland gearbox in the back. We also call this a dog box. So these are the things to look for. Um, cooling is a very important element on any race car. And I think this car has been modified a bit. So what we're going to do now first is let us have a look on the cooling first. Then we're going to look on the carburetor and then we're going to have maybe a little bit of a closer look on the engine itself and then on the gearbox and on the gear selector. I already did a video on this engine in more detail, but I'm going to take out this engine out of this car anyway. So um, at that time we'll have more detail. But these are areas to look for. One other element is to make sure that you have a good and solid exhaust and um, something on the exhaust which is important because nowadays you get a lot of constraints in DC belts so you have to have an exhaust which is easily swappable out and I'm not kidding what I'm saying easily swappable out because some of the tracks are now limited to 98 DC belts where I am if you go over that one you don't go on the track 
So that's why you have these quick disconnect releases on the pot. This is an inox pot, inox pipes, so I can remove this and you can put another one on. So if you're going to rebuild your race car or if you're going to restore one, make sure that you can actually swap out those mufflers because otherwise you may have a problem. If I was a plumber, maybe I might have been proud on this kind of copper plumbing that was done here. This kind of copper plumbing is typically what you find on heating systems. This is not for a car. Um, this looks tacky and I don't think it's right. This is certainly something I will change. The same thing is true on the top there for the swirl pot. And let me give you a little bit of a close up. So this whole area here looks so weird to me. Um, it's like they inserted something with some tape, making sure it does not leak. I'm going to change all this because this is crap. I mean, flat out crap. You shouldn't be building cars like this. And as we all know, cooling is very important in racing. So you want to make sure that the radiators are having a very good cooling efficiency. Now there is a radiator on the left, there is one on the other side as well. And both uh, are sure a good cooling. Now I'm going to take these off for sure and I'm going to get the grid uh, taken out and replaced by a high performance cooling system because I'm quite sure that this grid is already kind of clogged up over all those years. So it's a good thing to change your cooling radiators each time you rebuild a car. And here you have actually those brackets and aluminum that are holding up the radiator on one side. It's not the way I would do it. Now the parts of the radiator that are holding it up are cracked as you can see. So overall, yes, radiators need to go out, reconditioned and then put new brackets up. The good thing on this car is that we have a Hewland gearbox and I think this is the uh, H6 that we have on here. That's a good gearbox. It's what we call a dog box and you'll see more on this uh, once we take it apart and it has already associated differential with it in the back. So I don't think we have much of an issue here, but we will have to take a closer look on this gearbox, what has been done on it, because I'm afraid there has been some messing around with it in the past. So these are the drive shafts coming out of the differential and you want to make sure that your gators are good, that you have no oil leaks and look, there's a little bit of leak here. Uh, so in other words, either this is oil coming out of the differential or this is actually oil coming out of the CV joint here. Uh, it's kind of leaking. Uh, this, this is something we'll take apart anyway because we're going to take out the engine out of the car and we'll remove also the gearbox and put a new clutch in. Now this is the drive shaft on the other side and you can actually see that, I don't know what, this is like being rubbed off over here and I think it's because they wanted to prevent it from hitting actually the spring. So if I lift that up I could see that it's getting pretty close. So instead of having the shock sitting here I'm just going to move the shock a little bit to the other side. And it doesn't really matter because it has pivoting points on it and that way um, we won't have that issue. Now this bar right here is the bar that links the stick shift to the gearbox and I think it has a bit of too much play on it and um, that's something we'll certainly will replace with a new one because I want to make sure the shifting is properly done. But there's some more horror stories on this whole rod system that I can show you in a few seconds because there are certain things that are not right with this. Now this is the rod that is connected to the gearbox. And I don't know if you can see it here, this part right here. This is where there's a big dent and somebody welded up something because this bar is in the way. And then there's another bend right there. And uh, let me just see if I can show you that. All right, so I don't know if you can see it, but I've tried to highlight it. And this is the rod, which is going to the stick shift and then drives the gearbox. And here you can see the rod is hitting the frame they kind of cut out the piece, but still, this doesn't work properly. Um, it makes it hard to shift gears, and so this whole rod mechanism has to be modified and changed. And having the 12 volts going to the solder motor, rubbing against the, the bar, you know, for the stick shift, that is not a good idea. It's going to rub through eventually, and you get a flat out short. Do you remember when I said people mess around a lot with cars? Well, this is another example right here. Look at this bolt here. 
I don't know what's wrong with this, but they kind of put it in there with polyester. Most likely the tread was damaged, I don't know. So these are the kind of things I really don't like. And it's the same for many of the bolts that you see here and the nuts. Some are self-locking, others are not self-locking. And what that tells me is that whoever worked on this gearbox before and put it together like this is a real amateur. I mean, this is ridiculous. And there you see a crack in the well. There you see a crack in the differential that has been welded up. So hopefully that was done right. I don't know. We'll see once we take the gearbox out how that looks like. But these are all the things you really, really need to check. So this car doesn't have an oil pan, so it's, it's what we call a dry sump. So it's a very narrow sump, basically, and oil collects on the bottom and it's been sucked out through that connection up to this oil pump. And you can see what they've done here in terms of welding. In fact, it's kind of copper or brass welding they've done, and this looks really, really tacky. Uh, so this is something else we'll have to fix once everything is out of the car. So what we see here is the bottom of the oil tank and look at this, how that is kind of covered up with silicon. I think they actually have a hole in it or it was damaged and then they just covered up that whole thing with silicon. This is, this is no good. So this is something else we'll have to fix. We might even need a new uh, oil tank for this. So let's see if we can start up the engine and uh, see how badly it smokes. But then again, we'll do the complete engine review uh, once the engine is out of the car. I will check everything on that. But now I'm just trying to give you an overall assessment on this car and how much there is on it. All right, so I need to turn on the ignition, fuel pump. again. So this is the overflow from the engine. Uh, right now that feels okay but of course the engine is cold. I feel a little bit of airflow but not a lot. That is blow by. And the whole throttle mechanism looks a little bit tacky as well. It's poorly welded. You know, there's quite a bit of work on that. And you can see that we actually have a, a good oil pressure around four bar, which is good. Of course, temperature is not up to temperature yet. We only are around 50. So folks, as you can see, there is quite a bit of work on this race car. Although it looks quite all right from a distance, but once you start digging deeper into it, you'll find all these little nitty gritty things. Well, some of them are not that nitty gritty, like the copper plumbing that you use for heating systems in the house. Then we've got most likely a cracked oil tank that they patched up with some silicon. We've got polyester on bolts on the gearbox. You know, all these kind of weird things. And the, this is messing around, that's what I call it. This is no longer about you know, working on race cars. This is just messing around and just, you know, try to keep things going as cheap as possible. This is not what I do. So if you buy in a race car, you got to check all those things. And I knew that I had to do a lot of things on this car. So if the price is right, then go for it. 
So you will see me uh, repairing this race car entirely over the time coming. Um, I am going to take out the complete engine out of this car. I might actually completely respray the frame as well and take everything out that's in it and renew and replace and rework everything because there's so many little areas whereby things are wrong, like these rods that are banded. So I might as well take it completely apart and get it all sorted out. So this is going to take a while, probably the whole winter. So I hope you will enjoy it as much as I will. The only good thing is the engine seems to be working just fine. I did check the compression before and that was good. But then again, uh, we'll need to see. Once the engine is out, we'll do some more double checks. At least the engine is not leaking. That is a very positive thing. I don't know what the state of the clutch is and what type of clutch is in it. So that's something else we will renew once the engine is out. So we've reached the end of this video and I hope you really enjoyed it just like I did. And I'll see you in my next video. Bye bye.